this is sort of is where uh, a lot of things got started in, in my book, uh, Viral Spiral. Uh, I wanted to tell the story of, in the, in the big arc, of the history of how free software led to the invention of the Creative Commons license, which led to all these creative sectors that adopted the licenses, which led to the internationalization of the licenses. There's now some 70 countries that are porting the, or that have or are porting the licenses. And then it led to things like open education, the open educational resources movement, uh, the science commons, and the whole variety of innovations going on to make information more accessible as a commons there and a variety of open business models, a uh, burgeoning new front, and then uh, new forms of uh, direct citizen action and commons governance in the larger democratic polity. So that's sort of the rough arc that I cover in my book. And I could go through a lot of that, but with this crowd in particular, who is probably familiar with much of it, uh, perhaps not in the detail that I cover it, I decided that it might be a little pedestrian. and. Instead, I wanted to focus on some themes that provoked me in the course of doing my research in which uh, I consider uh, live frontier issues for me as I think about uh, what the commons means and its potential. So I titled my talk, uh, How Shall We Govern the Commons? Because I think that strikes me as a major issue that we have to deal with. It's come about partly because the commons has become a new model for creating value and for governing shared resources. Uh, as, a, as opposed to the way government might do it or the way markets might do it. Uh, I see the commons as a, as a new sector. And so the questions of how we govern the commons becomes a more urgent issue. Um, there's not much of an ongoing conversation about this, uh, let alone compelling theories. There are a handful of, of people like Johai Benkler and Jonathan Zittrain and Larry Lessig and Michelle Bowens who have uh, focused on this in one way or another. And I've taken a lot of inspiration and, and edification from their work. But I'd like to frame this conversation in a slightly different way as informed by my uh, research uh, in preparing my book. And let me just start with the commons as a paradigm. It is both ancient and new and remarkably misunderstood. Uh, it dates back, of course, to medieval times, uh, the famous grazing of sheep and cattle on the physical commons. Um, but it was more than just that. It was really a social system for managing shared resources, especially for personal and subsistence purposes, as opposed to market purposes. That came later with the enclosure of the commonses. Um, it was also a, a source of collective purpose to meet personal needs and a source of custom and tradition. Uh, so those are sort of some uh, paradigmatic meanings for the commons. I would recommend a book by the uh, historian Peter Leinbau called The Magna Carta Manifesto, which sketches the history of the commons in, in those times leading up to the Magna Carta and the commons as a political counterpart to law. The law didn't simply propound these principles. The commoners had to struggle for them. And the Magna Carta in Leinbau's reckoning was an armistice between the commoners and the king, with law being the articulation and, and formal clarification of that. So um, I think there's a lot of rich tradition to draw upon in the commons when we talk about it today. But uh, when we talked about the public domain was the closest we had to a commons uh, prior to say, I'll say arbitrarily say two, the year 2000. Uh, and the public domain was regarded by copyright traditionalists as basically uh, a junk, junkyard, a waste, wasteland. Because the only stuff that went there was stuff that had no market value. It was government documents. It was old sheet music. It was works that were more than 75 years old. And uh, you know, it was regarded as, an, uh, by one reckoning, uh, the, the uh, dark star in the constellation of intellectual property. You need, hardly needed to consider it. And in fact, the first law review article on the public domain didn't occur until 1981 with David Lang at Duke Law School. Uh, Jessica Littman followed up in 1990, the, the second major piece on the public domain. Uh, and there were other people like Peter Yazzie and Pamela Samuelson in the 90s, uh, Lessig and Benkler also. But it was a grossly underexplored realm. Uh, this, this Jack Valenti quote captures uh, much of the spirit of the, the standard line about the value of the public domain. A public domain work is an orphan. No one is responsible for its life, but everyone exploits its use 
until that time certain when it becomes soiled and haggard, barren of previous virtu its previous virtues. Who then will invest the funds to renovate and nourish its future life when no one owns it? So this... Yeah, let's hear it for the public. <laughs> <laughs> and, but this, uh, even now, and of course, in many circles, is the prevailing view uh, that the public domain is not really worth that much. And I thought it was interesting that in, 19, in 2001, when uh, Duke Law Professor Jamie Boyle hosted a landmark uh, conference on the public domain, he had trouble persuading Eleanor Ostrom, the Indiana U University scholar of the commons, albeit natural resource commons mostly, uh, to come to the conference. Uh, so she didn't quite intuitively see the connection or importance uh, of the two at the time. And so the discourse of the commons was really an arcane specialty that occurred mostly within academia. This started to change in the 90s as the web took root in 1994 and people started to see that uh, perhaps the public domain and social communities did create value. And Richard Stallman was arguably the first to demonstrate this in a powerful way uh, by demonstrating the efficacy and virtue of free software how communities coming together could create code that uh, was valuable. Uh, the more famous example was the Emacs commune that he started, a word processing collective. And uh, it basically showed that sharing and, inter and interoperability can, cre create, can create valuable new things. And it also created the instructive lesson that incompatible code led to a Tower of Babel, and that if deriv derivative improvements were not shared, there was this kind of entropy and the whole thing fell apart. So that proved to be, uh, as many of you can gather, an important lesson. The problem with the Emacs commune, which was also instructive, was that everything had to feed back to a centralized source, which was Stallman himself, uh, in order to integrate it into the program. And there was no legal enforcement. It was uh, purely a voluntary social scheme. And so uh, when MIT started a password system, it enraged Stallman and the hacker values uh, of the community he represented. So he decided to try to maintain uh, code as a shared collective resource, but he found that it was a vision with no legal tools to help uh, enact it. And this is where we come to software as a commons. Uh, Stallman's signal contribution, of course, was uh, in inventing the general public license, and uh, which helped give a legal enforceability to the commons so that uh, that which was created in the commons would be able to be uh, protected and stay within the commons and not be appropriated or privatized. Now, the GPL might have been uh, simply an interesting tool, but for the fact that the internet took off as a platform for mass collaboration, and then copyright industry started to tighten the screws on proprietary control. And the 90s were the time when all, so much happened in this regard, from the Sonny Bono Copyright Term uh, Extension Act to the DMCA, to uh, trademark expansion of trademark uh, prerogatives, expanding uh, how much trademark owners could control. And it uh, is the legacy we're dealing with now. But one thing that allowed uh, so much to happen on the commons, despite those things, was that new infrastructure was developing for building the commons. You had the technological infrastructure of open platforms and free software. You had legal platforms of licenses uh, at first, the GPL, and later the Creative Commons licenses. And then you had social communities and ethics and norms and shared ideals taking root. And together, these became tools for, as I put it in the subtitle of my book, uh, how the commoners could build a digital republic of their own. This was a way for starting to transcend the famous tragedy of the commons. Uh, Garrett Hardin on the left was a, a biologist and ecologist in the late 60s who published this famous uh, essay in Science Magazine, 1968, called The Tragedy of the Commons, saying that a commons in, in, invariably ends up being overexploited and ruined because people just come and take what they want and uh, there's nobody, no one there to protect the resource. Uh, this took root uh, as a cultural myth, uh, fueled by a lot of conservative uh, political ideologues and economists as what a commons was, something that's always necessarily overexploited. Near the end of his career, before his death, he acknowledged that he had mischaracterized a true commons, that he had described really an open access regime and not a commons, because a commons has rules and uh, for governance. It's not simply a, a free-for-all the way he had described it. <laughs> 
Um, there was another difference, at least as it applies to the, the uh, cyberspace, which is uh, he was describing a finite depletable resource, whereas in, in cyberspace it's an infinite expandable resource, where in fact, as Dan Bricklin, the uh, inventor of VisiCalc, a co-inventor, described it, uh, there's a cornucopia of the commons. And uh, in a more scholarly way, Carol Rose, the law professor at Yale, described it as the comedy of the commons, where the more the merrier. Uh, in, in other words, the more people who participate, the more value is created in the commons, provided there's certain rules for management. Uh, but still, the tragedy thesis has been a major cultural stumbling block to uh, understanding and appreciating the value generating capacities of the commons. And the point is the commons is generative. Uh, Jonathan Zittrain deals with this a lot in his recent book. Uh, we all know many examples of how this occurs, that the commons is not the wasteland that the theorists of the public domain had suggested, but in fact there's socially created value. And as Yohai Benkler uh, pointed out in Wealth of, of Nations, it's a macroeconomic and cultural force in its own right. And this is something I think we're just coming to terms with, uh, that the commons is in fact a sector uh, that's growing, and there's countless examples of different commons communities that are creating value. So this, because this is getting so large, proliferating, robust, it leads me to the question of how shall we govern the commons? Uh, I don't think we have uh, a clear idea. This, I think this area is terribly under-theorized about uh, what are the uh, principles by which it should be governed. Uh, Eleanor Ostrom, in her 1990 book, Governing the Commons, posed it this way. How should a group of principals who are in an interdependent situation organize and govern themselves to obtain continuing joint benefits while all face temptations to free ride, shirk, or otherwise act opportunistically? And she set forth eight design principles, uh, which she didn't, I think, uh, consider comprehensive or the last word but general guidelines for certain principles that allow a commons to be governed as a commons. Things like clearly defined boundaries around the community and appropriation and provision rules that are consistent with the local resources or the, the local conditions. Uh, the fact that people can participate in the decisions for governing the commons and that there's monitoring, transparency of it, and there's graduated sanctions against free riders or vandals and so forth. One uh, I've often struggled with the question of, well, what, how do you define a commons? And it, it's often very confusing because, precisely because of its local, situ, it's situated locally. Now, this slide, a, a variation of the slide was shown to me by Eleanor Ostrom once, and she said, that's a common. And I was a little confused. This represents a, a shoveled out snowbank in uh, South Boston where if you shovel it out, the neighborhood ethos is you have the entitlement to use that parking spot for the duration of the snowfall. And this is enforced quite vigorously by the neighborhoods, uh, some say in, a, in an over-aggressive or criminal way. Uh, but for me, uh, I, I, said, I said to Ostrom, well, why is this a common? She said, well, it's a shared understanding for, by the neighborhood about how to allocate a scarce resource. And the scarce resource is parking spots during a winter. Now, uh, I like this example because it helps illustrate, one, there's no master inventory of commonses, and the fact that it's a commons doesn't reside in the resource itself, but in the social community that's focused around the resource. So uh, it, helps, it helps me understand that the commons is a flexible paradigm that can apply to really many or even any type of resource so long as there's a defined community governing it. The way I once described it in a paper was, a commons arises whenever a community decides that it wishes to manage a resource in a collective manner with a special regard for equitable access, use, and sustainability. It's a social form that has long lived in the shadows of our market culture, but which is now on the rise. Uh, the parking uh, space issue also raises another in the, uh, the point that uh, you can have order without law in the phrase of uh, Yale property professor Robert Ellickson that you can have self-organized, socially enforced, informal types of governance of a resource uh, through shared understandings. And then one of the more controversial things that this shows is the tension between commons governance and government. Uh, 
uh, some people who maybe don't belong to that neighborhood try to park in that spot or throw the chair to the side and park in it, and we'll have the tires slashed. And this prompted uh, uh, the mayor to say, well, there's a two-day limit on this, or he really wanted to do away with it entirely and have city rules govern, but uh, I think agreed to a two-day rule. So there's a tension between, say, the government of a democratic polity and a, a more local defined commons is about whose uh, morality and sense of fairness and governance rules should prevail. And I think you can see there's a certain complexity where in some ways there's something, whole, something wholesome about a commons being able to have that subsidiary, subsidiarity and local control. In other ways you can see the need for a, a broader governance. Um, for me, uh, 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 an open question is, can we develop a new taxonomy for digital commons? It's because the, the idiosyncrasies of the chair and the snowbank applies in spades to the internet commons, is where everything's an on-the-fly experiment. We don't really have a general theory. Uh, commons is usually are the product of unique historical circumstances, personalities, the resource itself, the uh, peculiar culture of that community. And so we're on a really experimentalist frontier with uh, only some rudimentary theoretical explanations. There's some general principles, but uh, I think we need a more refined taxonomy. Uh, and maybe, I don't know if we dare to say, uh, try to de develop a consensus about how we might define the commons and build it. We know a bit about developing the software platforms and the legal licenses, and there's some pretty robust debates about the value of those. I do think we could use more study of the moral economy of commonses, the sociology of them, and the personal psychology, especially in the online world. And I know there's some empirical studies going on. There's a, a friend and colleague of mine at UMass Amherst, who's uh, Charlie Schweik, who's developing a uh, empirical model of uh, free software development and uh, trying to study that. I know there's others who have uh, waded into that territory. The sociology of the Wikipedians is a fascinating topic, if only because of the, the big scale and uh, success of that project otherwise. But what we see are different notions of freedom, how to uh, set community boundaries, how to devise social practices that work, and how much to rely on law or not uh, to help protect the commons. But the, the common goal of most of them is how do you, pr how do you protect the integrity of the shared resource and the community itself. So let me offer some uh, example or some distinctions that might matter as we think about this. One is the whole notion of open versus free. The Free Software Foundation uh, rightly makes a, a big point of this distinction, how open platforms uh, may be accessible and shareable, but their freedoms might not persist because it's really at the sufferance of the owner of that, of that open platform. And so we, we see this uh, played out a little bit in the, uh, on Flickr and its terms of service, or Facebook and its privacy terms of service, you know, where the, the uh, owner of that plat open platform can say, well, you know, I'm just going to impose my own terms without regard to the common, commons, because they're, you know, the commons, it's more of an implied social contract as opposed some, to a uh, contract where the commoners themselves have their own sovereignty. So the whole question of open versus free raises questions of uh, business appropriation versus community control, of uh, Larry Lessig's beautiful phrase, digital sharecropping uh, versus commons governance, or whether something should be monetized or whether the community can ma maintain it as an inalienable resource. And I should point out there is an overlap between ob open and free, but there is this big divide that sometimes can be quite functionally important. Another distinction is individual choice versus community. Um, the Creative Commons licenses do not necessarily create a commons, ironically. They're really just tools for, for building a commons as if you do so. But moreover, they privilege individual choice, which uh, may undermine the creation of some commons building, some critics charge, uh, because they allow opt-in or opt-out. Uh, and some people regard that really as a lesser form of commons than you're either in the commons or you're not in the commons. The, the GPL, for example, is I think a pure type of commons because there's really a binary choice. Are you a participant in this commons 
and if not, you're out. Uh, Creative Commons builds a more complicated, uh, individually driven set of commonses, which therefore has a different philosophical grounding. Um, sometimes these differences have ripened into, I think, tribal cultural differences, as might be seen in the quarrels between the Wikipedians uh, and the Creative Commons community over the uh, free documentation license and whether it can be migrated and under what terms to a Creative, creative Commons license. So uh, another distinction that we have to keep track of when we talk about Commons. Another one that I encountered a lot uh, in my research was, shall we build within the house of copyright the way uh, the GPL and the Creative Commons do, or should we challenge property discourse? Uh, one of the more forceful advocates on this topic uh, is uh, Neva Elkin Karen, the Israeli law professor, who has, I'll just read a brief quote from her, in which she uh, has misgivings about the Creative Commons for uh, reinforcing the, the normative discourse of property uh, property. She says, while, while ideological diversity may be crucial for the, the success of a social movement, and she's referring to Creative Commons, it may impair efforts to make creative works more accessible. The lack of a core perception of freedom and information may lead to ideological fuzziness. This could interfere with the goal of offering a workable and sustainable alternative copyright. She says that CC regime, I'm not, I'm not quoting, but paraphrasing, encourages narrow calculations of self-interest in the same attitudes towards property and individual transactions as the market economy. It does not promote a coherent vision of freedom that fortifies the commons as such. Well, partly in response to that, the Creative Commons uh, issued a, a so-called free cultural work seal and definition, which was an attempt to uh, encourage people to recognize that certain licenses are more free than others. And so the, the attribution and share, attribution share alike licenses are free, but the non-commercial and no derivatives licenses are not because they don't allow the freedom to modify without discrimination to anybody. Another set of distinctions uh, or criticisms of, the, of uh, how some commons are structured. From the left, you have uh, challenges that, well, how come uh, the commons isn't being used to challenge corporate power and neoliberal economics? So why is the, uh, the creative commons so uh, ready to play with certain corporate players. The global south, you have some people saying that uh, uh, the public domain, there's a famous uh, law review piece called The Romance of the Public Domain, which takes to, takes to task uh, the romanticization or supposed romanticization of the public domain by Western uh, legal scholars because it simply means that those in the south who open their works to the public domain have them ripped off by the most uh, powerful appropriator oftentimes multinational drug companies uh, who are uh, looking to uh, steal uh, works for free and then make a lot of market money, money on the market from them. Um, you have also from the South, you have uh, criticisms that a commons that depends upon institutions of law is itself uh, antithetical to their notion of the commons as a purely social means. There was a great a letter I once encountered, uh, open letter, from uh, the Rax Media Collective in New Delhi, which said, um, greetings, this missive arrives at your threshold from the proverbial Asiatic street located in the shadow of an improvised bazaar where all manner of oriental pirates and other dodgy characters gathered, into trade, gathered to trade in what many amongst you consider to be stolen goods. To this other com common, stolen goods are really borrowed because nothing is really owned. That goes on to say, we appreciate and admire the, term, the determination with which you nurture your garden of licenses. The proliferation and variety of flowering contracts and clauses in your hothouses is astounding. But we find the paradox of a space that is called a commons, and yet so fenced in and in so many ways somewhat irritating, in, somewhat intriguing. The number of times we had to ask for permission and the number of security check posts we had to negotiate to even enter a corner of your commons was impressive. Sometimes we found that when people spoke of common property, it was hard to know where the commons ended and where property began. So that's sort of a somewhat uh, southern, one southern perspective on commons is that happen to be guaranteed by civil society. Um, and then fair use advocates, some uh, evil, while uh, they would argue that uh, 
these creating of commons doesn't grapple with the existing state of copyright law. And frankly, we need to help uh, clarify fair and expand fair use to uh, empower people to deal with the commons as it works within copyright law. So you have these very different notions of what the commons is or should be. Yet another frontier that we're just now, I think, starting to encounter more forcefully is whether the common and markets are synergistic and compatible or more hostile to each other at a basic level, or does it depend upon what you're talking about? Um, my principle is that which is created in the commons should stay in the commons, dot, 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 with the corollary, unless the commoners decide otherwise, meaning they control the terms by which the, common, the resources of the commons are monetized. So I think you can have some constructive uh, collaborations be, between uh, online communities in the market, but what matters is the terms of that collaboration and how it's, how it's uh, transacted. Uh, the point to remember is that I think the commons and the markets each have their own value propositions, and if each are going to create the kind of value, the different qualitatively different kind of value they do create, you need to respect their, uh, their f core functioning, which is one reason why it's so important to protect the commons. Um, Larry Lessig's remix book starts to grapple with some of these issues uh, of the hybrid economy. And uh, he sketches a number of uh, working examples. Let me just run through a handful of paradigms that I see in which uh, it's sort of a spectrum of open business to, um, to traditional commons. One are the open platforms we've already discussed. You have uh, businesses using free gener user-generated content. Uh, Another, which I find uh, an interesting hybrid, is the, the, iPhone, the iPhone model, which could be called a curated open business model, where they want to reap the benefits of an open, uh, open participation, an open platform, but still have a degree of proprietary control. You have things like the Innocentive, which is the uh, drug industry uh, queries where people can uh, submit answers and get a bounty, essentially, if they provide uh, useful knowledge. Then there's uh, a whole other area that Eric von Hippel has sketched out in his book, Democratizing Innovation, of basically with the community being the platform for a market. And you build a market on top of a community, uh, uh, and they sort of have a symbiotic relationship. Uh, Hippel, von Hippel suggests things like a lot of extreme sports, extreme skateboarding, skiing, uh, where those communities will be the first to innovate with new equipment, and that can be a source of R&D for some companies. The idea is that the commoners become a source of R&D innovation, word of mouth marketing and purchases, and the market fulfills their needs in the way that they perhaps could not do so themselves. Uh, then there's other examples of building a respectful interface between a commons and the market, the way uh, Magnatune, a music uh, record label does, or one could say the way the Grateful Dead did back in the day, where they allowed the circulation of the music, they had a respectful relationship with the community, but they still made money through the, their concerts and merchandising and legitimate CD sales. Uh, then there's a new species of what I would call market-oriented nonprofits, where the goal is not to make maximum profit, but they are nonetheless engaging with the marketplace to develop revenues to serve their nonprofit mission. And then finally, you can see things uh, like non-market cooperatives, which uh, one could see Linux, the Linux community or thousands of other uh, free software open source communities as forms of uh, nonprofit cooperation. Um, the point, I suppose, that I want to end with, and then I'd love to have a discussion with you uh, about some of the things I've presented, I see the commons as a new social metabolism for governance and law that happens to have some deep economic and cultural impact. And uh, I consider a lot of these issues very, uh, for me at least, cusp issues because I don't have all the answers, but there seems to be enough historical development to suggest these are some questions that are worth addressing. So with that, I'd love to have some questions, comments, and feedback. Yes, sir. Um, uh, could you apply uh, some of this perspective uh, 
to specific uh, examples. Uh, you mentioned Wikipedia, for, for example, uh, on, um, and, and the different flavors that they come in. Uh, and compare and contrast, uh, I guess Huffington Post might be? Uh, mm, open platform with participation. Okay, so cause I'm, maybe I'm less familiar than some other people here yeah. in, in the room, but if you could just give some concrete examples of... Sure, well, there's... Uh, you have things like Wiki Travel, which has user-generated travel guides to different <coughs> cities, which the public, the owner of that site is now trying to develop a for-profit publishing arm based on that. That's an interesting mix of the two. But you have uh, a lot of online discussion communities, like say the Daily Coast, uh, or which is a user-generated uh, community of, of commentary, which has no profit purposes. They do have, so they do raise some revenue through advertising, which a lot of these communities are. I don't, do you have, uh, I, I could go back to the slide that has the internet archives, the uh, publicresource.org, which is a, a repository for government documents that are uh, being held by the government as not being made widely available. They're sort of like court decisions. Um, I guess maybe most free to some mixture of the two, just some examples along the spectrum or? Well, I haven't laid them out neatly for you okay. in a spectrum like that, but the, the uh, communities that have no profit purposes that are for themselves, uh, you know, fan fiction communities, for example, uh, where they trade stories based on, uh, they were, I don't know if you know about fan fiction where you take a Star, Star Trek and write your own stories based on the characters, for example. There's lots of, that, that's arguably a, a, a cultural commons that controls their own fate. Uh, if one were to find a way to graft on a business thing to it without ruining the community, that would move it towards uh, a more hybrid model. I don't know if that answers your question per se, but... Uh, I should go back to the slide that, uh, there we go. Flickr has lots of photo sharing, which uh, it's an open platform, but uh, there's open, lots of open sharing. Presumably they're not going to uh, ruin that commons because their business model depends upon respecting the sharing capacity of its customers. Um, Wikimedia is expanding the Wikipedia franchise in different areas. There's wiki quotes, there's wiki species, where it's a user-generated collection of uh, information on those areas. Gemendo, uh, a vast re repository of music that's available for free, uh, all of it licensed under CC licenses. So those are some examples. Yes, sir. I was just interested in your, in your uh, go back to your last slide. Again. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, because you're offering a, a, a definition here, and and it's a metaphorically, it's a natural one. It's not a spatial one. It's not a. Uh, it's not real estate. And I, I I wonder how if you've thought about how well that can fly, because people are so used to thinking of the commons as a place. It's and you go on the net. You don't go kind of in it. You know? Well, uh, who knows if it'll take or not. Yeah. It, but the point is, it's relational. And, and, and the relations is what makes it work or not. And I think arguably that's what makes markets work or not. There's sort of an undergirding of trust and re relationship that has to make, that's ne needed for a market and we're seeing the dysfunction of it right now. So. But what if there's a relator sphere that's not metabolic? Not me metabolic? Yeah. I mean, metabolic sounds to me like it's burning energy or well, see, the, let me read a, a brief passage that... It produces gas. <laughs> David Johnson, who's a professor at New York Law School, had a, a wonderful essay. Um, I forget the exact title, but I want to read a brief quote from it because he described... Um, he, just, he was an inspiration for me in this, where he said... Uh, Uh, hold on a second. Uh, he, he compared the, a com he used he didn't use the word commons, but he 
he agreed with me that he, that's, he had the same thing in mind. The goal of a successful legal organism must be agreed upon by those who live within it because a legal system is nothing more than a collective conversation about shared values. When it ceases to be that kind of internally entailed organism, the law becomes mere power. Social order, quote, becomes tyranny, and the only option over the long term, at least, is war. Organisms can't be repaired from the outside, but with reference to interactions that take place primarily online among willing participants who seek primarily to regulate their own affairs, that is, that's exactly where existing governments are situated, outside the vibrant, self-regulating online spaces they seek to regulate, et cetera. Yeah. So, yeah, which is why I was captivated by the parking space example. It, create, it, it not only illustrates that self-organizing organism aspect of it, but the tensions it spawns by its relations within the existing legal order. I'm curious about the, the, the many lawyers in the room see the law the same way. Does it look to you the same way? Same way as what? As, a, as a, an organism or as a habitat. Do we have any takers? <laughs> Let's go like this. I, I hear you talk about that metabolism conjures up the notion of consuming energy, and, and but I mean, but I'm with you about the homeostatic aspects of a commons. Is that it's not frozen? There's give and take, and you know, back and forth, but all around, uh, you know, some sort of set point, if you will, which might move, but if it did, it would be very gradually. So I, I'm not so sure habitat. Habitat, like you say, is real estate. No, no, no. I, I think that's one reason the commons is often sometimes outperforming markets because of that organic quality of information transfer and social trust and, and community, which for a market is far more cumbersome if you have to do it in hierarchical ways or through you know, uh, transactional means with money or lawyers or, you know, which is part of the value proposition. I think it's useful not to confuse two separate meanings of law. One is law in principle. We all live under the law. It's like a thing we, it's a truth to which we aspire. And in that sense, it has exactly these qualities that David's talking about. Um, that is, a, it's a sh set of shared value that somehow exists as if it's like a natural law. It's our collective conscience. And then the other way of thinking of law is as a social environment. It is, it is definitely a mediated discourse in which people are assisted by the structure that it offers to relate. And in that sense, very like the technologically assisted community of the commons, the various different ones that David is here describing. I think. So the, the, in both senses, I think it, they're similar, but shouldn't be confused. And one of the issues raised is how the law of the commons comports with existing structures of law and what kind of rapprochement they might develop. I mean, I have some of my, the arguments I have with my liberal friends about which form of order ought to prevail when I think that, you know, there's something to be said for both sides, but the kind of interaction matters between formal law and social law. So, let's have another question. Yes? Could you talk about the international nature of the common problem? I mean, you've got multiple jurisdictions, perhaps contradictory laws. Right. Well, that's something I'm grappling with right now. And I, I was recently turned <coughs> on to a great law review piece called Global Legal Pluralism, which tries to make the case that so much of the law has to deal, at least on the international scale, has to deal with uh, so the social on the ground realities anyways, whether it's with ethnic nationalism or some tribal community or whatever, that um, there's a case to be made for trying to more frankly deal with these different types of law in the broadest sense, rather than simply have some top-down uh, formalistic nation-state driven form of law. Uh, that's the best that I can go right now, but you're absolutely right. There's tensions once you start to expand this transnationally uh, and how that comports with 
existing structures of international law. Yes, Wendy. Um, it's a very interesting talk. One piece that's sort of sticking in my mind is the question of governance is partly sort of uh, horizontal dividing among uh, things that have been distributed to a, into a commons and partly vertical uh, shared interest in maintaining a platform uh, on which the commons can operate. So Wikipedia depends on uh, relations among its contributors and all of the contributors share an interest in maintaining a neutral internet on which they can uh, build that platform. Does does this get into of how we can push for open platforms on which to build commons? Well, that's um, one thing I immediately think of. I remember talking to Larry Lessig once, and he said he saw the amassing of a constituency for a commons, for free culture, was itself an important political strategy for securing open networks. I mean, have my own role in copyright law, a frontal assault on copyright law was going nowhere, which is why the Creative Commons was so brilliant in helping to build a diversified movement. So I think that creating these functional communities of social practice is one way for spurring that innovation and political demands and policy demands. Um, and I, I, have, I have to say a phrase that is very, I've learned recently that's very important to me. The commons is about commoning, and the commons is a verb. And that's important to realize because it's not just this inert resource, it's the social community that actively does or does not uh, do something to protect its collective interest. Mako. So I like your, uh, I mean, I, I like the idea of sort of individual and community and sort of what Creative Commons are talking about individual rights and sort of maybe the free software movements sort of in the community, right? And in the community side, and I, you know, I like that characterization because it puts me on the side that uh, I'd like to be identified with. But I think that you maybe are overstating uh, the degree to which free software has uh, sort of figured this out. Because the reality is that the vast majority of sort of free or open source software projects are actually very hierarchically gover governed. Mm -hmm. And the reason that that works, I think, and that, it's, that it works out, it sort of turns into a commons. Is that you've got a couple. Um, I mean, so, so I mean, the other thing that's worth pointing out is that if you look at the the, the freedoms and the the sort of those core freedoms there, they're actually also highly individualistic in terms of the way that mm. they're describing freedom. Right? Users will have the freedom to do this, 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 and this. Right? Mm -hmm. And and this worked out because when it, historically, as we use software, right, every user has a copy of their software. Right? And so if you empower that user to have control over their software, they have the ability to do it. And yeah, when we're when we're working in communities, um, you know, we have this sort of uh, yeah, they might be governed sort of very hierarchically. There's always the threat of either a fork um, in, that, in that I can say, yeah, I don't like the way you're doing it. I'm going to take it and we're going to go build somewhere else. Or you have the ability for each user to actually change that software before they use it, right? Which is something that, that happens uh, repeatedly. Um, the reason there, there are hundreds of different distributions, all of which ship slightly modified versions of all the major pieces of sort of free software. So we're seeing exactly that type of uh, uh, comments going on, but it's because there's highly distributed control over the nature of the artifacts themselves. Now, when we, um, uh, free software is actually, I think, at a major crisis right now that is, for the most part, underappreciated in the community because increasingly often when we use software, there's actually one piece of software that is used by lots and lots of people. Every web service basically falls into this category, right? Mm. Um, uh, there's exactly one Wikipedia or Facebook or Google, you know, one set of code that's running. And, and, and even if those tools are free, even if we move to a system like uh, Flickr and we have all the code, it doesn't necessarily make any, any of the users more free because they can't either because they don't have access to data or because even if they do have access to data, Wikipedia is a great example. Going and creating my own Wikipedia doesn't actually help anyone, right? right. Um, so so what, we're, what we're finding is that, in fact, our rules for collective governance are really based on a set of uh, highly individual ideas of control. And when, we're, and when we're talking about community and collective control, uh, I think the free software communities are really at a lack of ideas for how to manage this. I think that you're right to say that it's a social problem, and I say, I'd maybe go a little farther and say that it's more of a political problem as well, um, in, the, in that there's a politics around this and we need to start thinking about this. Mm -hmm. But, um, I mean, so, so I, guess, I, I guess the question is, how, uh, what are the examples of, of, of uh, what are the examples of communities? So I'm, as someone in the free software community, I'm really interested in how we can sort of help bridge this and think about how we build network services that are under control, that, that are actually commons themselves, where we have a single shared artifact and where we, I mean, I guess, I guess we're back to a world of a certain type of scarcity, uh, in, in a sense. And so, and so, what what are the ways in which we sort of uh, uh, move forward in this? And 
uh, where do we look for help? Wow. Whoa. <laughs> well, I mean, I've been thinking no, about I mean, this a lot. No, no, I mean, I appreciate, I, I agree with what you say, uh, that there is far more individualism within the commonses of free software than perhaps I fully acknowledged. I think part of the issue is that so many free software communities, at least um, my friend Charlie Schweik, who's been studying SourceForge uh, communities, the most, the preponderance of them are sm relatively small, in which you can have a social governance in, a, in that level. It does get political, as you say, as you try to scale it. And how do we organically scale uh, and devise the political constitution, quote, for these larger communities is, I think, a key issue. And I think there's a lot of thrashing about for precisely that question. And I don't know the answer, but I do know that people very much want to make that work and have relationships that are not the types as mediated by a market, but are mediated in a different way. And it sounds like, Charlie, you might have something to say to well, that. Well, I'm very impressed by research done by David Hoffman hmm. on Wikipedia basically the dispute resolution of Wikipedia, uh, the process. Um, first of all, he was looking at Wikipedia as a functioning example of uh, a commons and asking, uh, well, what, what made it work? And was telling a dynamic story about it through time in which he describes the evolution of the dispute resolution mechanism that goes on in the discussion pages. And the point that seems so striking to me was that uh, the resolution of the disputes don't have anything to do with content. Mm -hmm. They actually are a process mm -hmm. which winnows out the people who are willing to learn the norms of the community. Mm -hmm. And it, when, when you get to the end of that process, if you push it all the way to the end, maybe somebody leaves the community. But really, they're, they're, they've cons constructed a way of creating a border of their community that does what you were suggesting, keeping out the griefers, mm -hmm. uh, uh, and uh, suggesting that that's essential as a dynamic element of a continually functioning, technologically assisted community of mm -hmm. humans. So I recommend it. David Hoffman, and uh, he's got another partner, and it sounds very much like the kind of a structure that if you were looking for structure, you could do a lot worse than to look at that model. But the point also is they have to be organically grown and not simply taken yeah, off the shelf. Yeah, that's true. So, yes. So, um, <clears throat> I thought Mego's point was extremely provocative, and I, I want to be even more depressing than he is, which is to say that um, uh, Mego's putting forward this concern that this old model of the commons largely had to do with this idea that we were all extremely talented homesteaders. Uh, we could digitally split our own wood and you know make our own butter. And, and the truth is most of us can nowadays. Uh, it, it doesn't necessarily help to have the Wikipedia code because even if we brought it up, we couldn't run it, we couldn't manage it, we couldn't scale it. So the notion that somehow that code is out there and open is, is almost sort of a red herring. It's sort of beside the point. But it, it's even worse than that. Actually, most of the interesting community behavior, a lot of the interesting social dynamics right now are on commercially controlled, mm -hmm. closed communities of one fashion or another. Mm -hmm. And so far, the attempts to have a constitutional moment in something like Facebook have been pathetic at right. best. Right. Um, so one of these questions really becomes, is there a way to take this, I think, extremely good thinking about the commons, what works in a commons, and bring some of this thinking into some of these commercial spaces? Does that have to happen from the start and essentially say, let's create different types of spaces that aren't as commercial as we think about it? Or is there a way to take what you are documenting here as working in a community space and essentially say to someone like a Facebook or to a Flickr, look, you actually don't have an asset without the user participation. And unless you find a way to respect some of the values surrounding a commons within that, you're not actually going to have a business. Therefore, you have to find a way within your corporate structure to support some aspect of commons governance. Well, I, I agree. You're go that's the right direction. I mean, it's one reason I'm so fascinated in open business models, because I think finding the artful, politically respectful um, accommodation between traditional businesses and the online communities is where it has to go. And whether you can do that post hoc, Facebook style, you know, I don't. I agree. You know, they had some minuscule number of people who participated in their 
referendum over the terms of service. So it may just, I, I don't, that's sort of, an, I think, a really interesting political question of how existing open platforms might be, quote, reformed, or whether we need to start conceptualizing new revenue models that combine business and, and commons purpose together in some integrated model. You know, I, there aren't too many examples to draw upon, but I think of things like Gemendo, uh, which is sort of a wonderful melding of, of that social purpose with uh, the business. But it's something I'm grappling with, and I keep trying to find these provocative small-scale examples that might be the germ or DNA for a, a different model. Yes? Uh, I'm Paul Wish, so I can witness that the tragedy of commons exists. Oh, it does? I mean, it's really devastated the country. Uh, and I think the reason why it, it, it devastated it so badly was not that there, were, there was no structure in it, or there were no rules, or there was no governance, because all of them were there. All of them existed. But I, I think that the reason was the, the reason was that uh, uh, the structures were not aligned or, or didn't align the public interest and private incentives, mm -hmm. right? Because intellectuals of the system assume that people are half angels and they will contribute to, to public good with, with no incentives, with no motivations, and it ended up with individuals either three riding mm -hmm on the public good or trying to capture it. Mm -hmm. So I don't, I also don't buy what economists say that we are all selfish because apparently we're not, but we are self, I think we are self-interested. For instance, uh, well, I, I'm self-interested in the way that I try to influence my students back in Poland how, what, what justice means mm -hmm. uh, because uh, I want to influence legislation in my country to make it better. Mm -hmm. So I'm not selfish. I try to contribute to the to the to commons, right? Mm -hmm. Both education and the other thing is are commons. Mm -hmm. But I'm incentivized to this. I'm motivated to contribute, to give more than to take. Mm -hmm. Right? You didn't mention this question of motivations, of incentives, of uh, aligning uh, the, the the this commons good uh -huh. and private good uh, would you develop on it? Well, I, I agree that self-interest is far broader than traditional economists regard it. Much, I think, depends upon getting a functional, um, a functional legal, technological, and social platform for people to participate in. Because otherwise, you're right, once it gets captured, there becomes the and free riders prevail, and you do have the tragedy. The demoralization is such that you know it's hard to recover it. So I think part of our challenge is to devise structures that can be um, uh, hardy, sustainable, and serve this broader sense of self-interest. We do have all sorts of civil society structures, you know, public libraries or parent teachers associations or whatever, which are some sort of vehicle for that. But can you be more specific about it or well uh, more specific uh, you you asked about, about the general this process how to align the private interests and uh, public interests, the interests of the commons uh, in I don't know cyberspace. See, well, the where matters, because if it's in the natural resource realm, which is depletable, yeah, of course. there's a different of politics. Course. Of course. And then in the regulatory, <laughs> part, of, part of my problem is a disenchantment with the regulatory state as the vehicle for solving that. Mm -hmm. Because it's so okay. captured and uh, distant from the resource <laughs> and the people themselves. Mm -hmm. So I think it's partly how can we grow viable, functional communities that have a sense of shared purpose and commitment and the online world seems to be incubating a lot of those, which is why I see some promise in that, uh, because it's a public platform that can push back on the existing political institutions, sometimes effectively. Uh, you and then you. <laughs> yes? I just wonder if you could comment on uh, to what degree is power concentrated in, in different commons? Like, if you look at a lot of these, they're, they're ostensibly commons, they're open to the public, um, but you know, in practice, there's usually like a very small group of individuals um, who, who hold veto power over things. Like Richard Stallman effectively holds veto power you know, right. over how like new works, right? If you look at any sort of major open source project, there's maybe two or three developers. 
you know, probably because they originally started or came in really early, right. who sort of decide everything else. And, you know, and, and it's really easy to find, right? Like, you go for any open source project, and you just Google, like, pick the name of the lead developer and put in, like, is an asshole after that, <laughs> right? And you'll find, you know, everyone, like, sort of hates this concentration of power. Uh -huh. um, and, you know, and I was just thinking about it, and it sounds really similar to how um, sort of, like, international relations, international political economy, uh, in order for free trade to happen, in order for, or just, like, general peace and stability, you know, a lot of people theorize that you need a hegemon to sort of enforce certain rule sets. Uh -huh. Uh, so I guess my question is, in in commons, you know, to what degree do you need sort of like a de facto hegemon? I think you do, or at least you need de facto structures that have legitimacy, and if it, it can reach a crisis point, I think, where people say, that guy's an asshole, and, uh, but then we have the forking problem that Ben was mentioning, is maybe not viable to fork at a level when it has such dominance, it's the equivalent of a, of a concentrated monopoly. I, so I think that's kind of a political quandary we face when a commons gets concentrated leadership that's not truly accessible and transparent. Uh, you make a, you there are also, there are also examples, many of the most high profile um, and largest free open source software projects actually are, uh, are governed very democratically. Um, the Debian project, um, uh, the Gnome project, um, I mean they, they, they have, Enfranchised, they have an enfranchisement system where you contribute and you know get a vote. You sort of, there the, there there are certainly people who have roles that are sort of delegated, but those are all recallable by a vote by the developer. So there so there are there are counterexamples to that as well. Um, and the other example is, is that many of the most high profile uh, 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 projects and the ones where people have complained most about sort of uh, the actions of uh, uh, the leadership have in fact been forked. Um, uh, 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 even even GNU Emacs uh, was forked successfully for a long time, and the fork uh, uh, was able to you know both. Both projects uh, persisted, but XEMAX and Emacs were widely used for a long time. The GCC, another same, 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 same leader uh, in question here, uh, also worked for a number of years. Um, and there were actually three forks that were ongoing um, and widely used for a long period of time. And they actually merged back together, which is an interesting sort of. Uh, there's an interesting sort of uh, uh, question about the costs associated with maintaining forks and duplication of work, and this, uh, uh, and and some of the trade-offs that people make. But they also just resolved some of the political differences and personal differences uh, in, in 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 that process. So. Um, and then there's examples like uh, uh, Inkscape is an example of a, of, a, of, a, of a piece of free software where people have actually forked and where the forked version became dominant over time and no one uses the old version anymore. So um, um, I would say that, there, that, 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 that you can find, uh, 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 I'm not, uh, I, I agree that it happens uh, much of the time, but there's also many of the most successful examples are counter examples of that. So I'm, I'm more optimistic about uh, doing, uh, about, about possibility. Could be here. Yes, sir. Oh, yes, go ahead. It's kind of weird that you mentioned Debian, though, right? Because, like, the general attitude in Debian is, like, we're getting our butts kicked by Ubuntu, which is just Debian, but taken over by Canonical and Mark Shuttleworth. So, uh, as, a, as, a, uh, as, a, one of the, as a Debian developer for more than 10 years, and the founder of the Ubuntu project, I would say that, that um, to this day, uh, Debian continues to attract more developers um, um, and, has, and, and, and is a much larger active uh, project. There, there's an interesting question as to the degree to which having a large user base is, uh, is, is important to the health of a, to, uh, of a community, right? Um, and that's precisely the question that I think uh, people in Debian and Inventory are struggling with. But to this day, uh, Debian remains a much more vibrant uh, example of this sort of common space production. Um, even if it's not as successful as an example of, uh, of, of creating a product that's used by more people. So, um, okay. Yes, sir. Briefly, yeah. Um, the public good has only come up, you know, tangentially here. And I wonder if you could talk about the relationship between um, commonses and, and public goods, and particularly in reference to, to government, which showed up very briefly uh, uh, in form of tension. I mean, we think of, maybe it's quaint, but uh, that governments are the pro providers of public goods, or somehow they... They do that, um, and there's quite a number of public goods that are, are mm -hmm. being developed in these commons production well, that's, forms. That's, so where where can that go? And well, that's partly that? something I'm grappling with these days because clearly the regulatory state has been inadequate for protecting the public good on its own terms. By its, uh, partly because the market has co-opted or compromised, I think its ability to do that. It for me it points out the. Um, the vastness and the scale of concentrated power trumping a community that has any meaningful control over it. 
therefore growing new meaningful communities of meaningful control can have a salutary if not reformist possibility and they all if only by the example of asserting a public good that's different from that proposed by the market by having something that can be inalienable can't be ripped off and privatized that's itself the, the every commons is itself a little mini living community trying to enact some form of the public good that's arguably better or at least qualitatively different from that which the market will will generate so simply diversifying forms of public good that can be delivered in meaningful persistent ways is good and it builds a constituency that can help be reformist uh, if you get a big enough constituency of commoners it's going to be a counterpoint if not a uh, a refuting example of people or a protesting bit, bit of people to agitate for more than what they might otherwise agitate for as consumers which restricts their identity and sense of possibility considerably so and that's kind of not a great answer to you but uh, I do think if you have market uh, market government commons, you can start to change the equilibrium dynamically a bit more than simply the kind of agitation that liberals have been doing for the past 50 years. <laughs> yeah, please. Uh, since, hmm. so it, uh, I want to go back to the question of uh, the uh, international uh, issues around having an international commons where the same item, the same single, say, digital item, um, can be considered to be in the commons within one country, same item, same URL, same place, in another country is not considered to be considered to be absolutely out of the commons, and you're going to sue your asses off if you violate that. Um, do we resolve, in which case the commons sounds more like a set, set of licenses than a set of well, Are you talking about the same set of content yes. on a website? Yes. Okay. Yeah. OK. Yeah. Um, how do we how do we resolve that or do we never resolve it do we just continue to have a fragmented view of what constitutes i think this is my off the cuff i think we have a fragmented view one thing that i've one thing that i've appreciated from mucking around in the commons is their fractal pointillist perspective the pointillist in that that trying to amass a unitary theoretically consistent worldview of the commons is doomed to failure if only because all of them have rootedness in a in distinct communities so uh, uh, I've resigned myself to that and it's almost, almost a different metaphysic if that's the case is there some um, sort of meta rule above the uh, laws and rules about commons, governance from commons, it says, well, okay, here's how you govern a world in which we are always going to no, have. No, see, that's the theoretical frontier I was talking about. I mean, I think that as commons has become more rooted and bump up against existing structures, we're going to have political con confrontations about it. And we're not allowed to say, well, but in order to maximize and provide maximum freedom for multiple commons, we need, therefore, to have a meta rule that says that's the right direction to go. <laughs> that's the, I mean, I haven't figured that one out, but I think that's the right direction to go. Is how you have a polity or a policy structure that's hospitable to maximum commons growth, because the, just as the government subsidizes the market in numerous ways because there's a presumed benefit from promoting market activity. The commons creates value. Why shouldn't government help promote the incubation and proliferation of commons as creating other sorts of value, social conviviality, uh, economic work? You know? So, uh, but that's that's a political frontier we haven't quite gotten to yet. Wendy. Do you think there's a natural size limit to commons? Ooh. That they. That's. I would. I my inclination would be say yes. But there's all sorts of technological prostheses that are being invented to help scale communities. You know, if we get, you know, open ID systems, perhaps. I, I don't, I don't I, know. But, but hearing but, you say a lot about of the way commons grows out of relational interactions and shared norms, do those diffuse as we try to well, add more? I think to the extent if we're going to use an ecosystem model, just I'll let you answer and follow up in a second. If you're going to use an ecosystem model, you know, species have boundaries for a purpose. 
And so perhaps there's some principle of speciation going on that might say, you know, getting too big, you become too inefficient and you're a dinosaur. Or I, the answer is I don't know. <laughs> but it's a very, I think, a germane question. Yes. I it's something that you kind of make I was talking about earlier, which roughly I'll characterize like the, the limitations of technological scale at the present. Um, so like Facebook has, has a fence around um, Wikipedia has a fence around um, Maybe Maybe one that's less high, maybe they're not extracting value from what's inside the fence, but nonetheless it has to be a fence because you can't distribute the servers everywhere. I can't run Wikipedia on my laptop. I can't share with other people in this way. Um, I think it's, it's interesting and it suggests that like, the existence of technologies like BitTorrent, where you have a, a true commons that is actually like, distributed everywhere, where people are, are sharing something using computational resources they have available. And I, like, the existence of something like this suggests that there, there's a new direction for these things to head, which is outside of the fence. Um, but it's just a matter of, of figuring out technologies that will, will in, increase the size of the fence we can build and, and include everyone in, in extending that fence and, and growing it. That's a good way of putting it because yeah. the commons does have a fence. I, I would use the word fence very loosely. Yeah, very loosely. But, right. but, but yeah, it has some way to protect the integrity of its asset. Right. So, what, yes. One of the things that's really exciting about this uh, commons idea in general is that it has tremendous potential for the developing world where that technology is severely limited but where they can exploit the value of a commons whether it's in a website or it's a movement or it's a state of mind I think it's something they can benefit from. Moreover, so, uh, it's more endemic to pre-market or non-market cultures than to us where we're so suffused with market norms Whereas for them, it's second nature. There's a real danger in that argument as well, uh, which is that until you have commons enshrined across international law, you end up with situation after situation of something that's sort of held to be a cultural asset in commons, then getting enclosed in another country. So if you want some good fun, read about the turmeric patent. Uh, on how turmeric was used for years and years. I mean, literally uh, documented in third century Indian texts for wound healing, uh, but then sort of crossed over into the American medical establishment uh, in part with Indian doctors coming over, found itself patented by a large pharmaceutical company, and then the Indian government literally had to fight the patent claim in U.S. court using third century Sanskrit texts as, uh, you know, prior established... Uh, uh, Prior art. Prior art, thank you. I'm missing the phrase to, to do this. The, the concern that starts happening as countries start trying to document cultural knowledge and put it together in a commons is that those commons, if not adequately protected, become places for international corporations essentially to mine intellectual property and then lock it off country by country. So it, it's absolutely the right impetus, it's absolutely the right direction to go in, but there's this giant unsolved problem having to do with asymmetric legal regimes and the difficulty of you know, someone in the Solomon Islands trying to protect a small snippet of music held in common that gets recorded by Deep Forest and, you know, becomes a $5 million selling album. Um, so it, it's, it's absolutely the right way to push, but the fact that we don't have a better sense for how to govern across legal jurisdictions ends up being an incredibly difficult problem. And the best case example of that is the struggles between indigenous peoples and Western IP systems. Well, uh, we have five more minutes, or we can break it. I'd be happy to talk to anybody individually. Any, any more questions? Yes? You had mentioned just briefly that commons can fail, and, and it seems like you've come across many of these failure modes. What can you uh, tell us about the common themes or the most common failure modes um, in recent times? Common failure modes. I haven't developed that. <laughs> I mean, I would think it would be the standard a violation of the rules, not having a defensible legal or technological or social boundary around your commons, not having adequate transparency and enforcement for vandals or free riders, you know, those kinds of classic uh, reasons are why commons is fail. But part of, part of what's so fascinating, I think, about the, the online world is this kind of fertile robustness of commons is incubating themselves and proliferating and dealing with the theory later. It's not as if the theory is driving it. That's coming 
after the fact. Charlie. David, I think of the commons as everything you can reach for free without any more definition than that. If I can go on the net and I can get it for free, it, to me it's like part of the commons. And so what I hear is, and Ethan's comment perfectly describes it, as have others, there's, there's these tremendous forces that want to capture the potential of the commons. And what we're looking for, what you're looking for in a way, is uh, the engine that makes the commons itself robust enough to resist that. Mm -hmm. uh, and yeah, that's precisely. Yeah, and um, so it it has it has about it, and at least I think of the law as basically the instrument of enclosure. So that for me at least, the route to building that robustness is not a matter of litigating. No. I mean when I when. The idea that somehow we're going to persuade people it's the right thing to do and they're somehow going to do it, rather than looking at it as actually the building up of a Which force. Which has arguably been the political agenda of liberals yes, exactly. for so long that they've exactly. neglected the Exactly. So uh, to me, an awful lot of it comes down not to this macro question of how do we govern cyberspace or the commons, but y your more interior questions of how do given enterprises build self-sustaining business models on a gift economy. That, thank you for saying that. That's precisely the point. You know, a digital republic of our own. We're not looking to the government. We're not looking to yes. market. And so we're devising our own tools and our own terms. And if the rest of the world ignores us, that's fine. We're building our space. Exactly. So, you know. I would say that to, that might integrate Wendy's comment about potential size limitations with the question about hegemonic domination creating order is that mm. what you're describing and back to your organism mm. metaphor is the common sounds like <clears throat> it needs to be as you just said self-defining mm -hmm. rather than exteriorly defining so that it's not so much that there's going to be a fence around it of varying size it's that the tools with which the commons creates and uh, well, I hesitate to say governs but self-organizes and maintains itself right. are going to define its effective size and the more you've got tools that allow spontaneous aggregation of members to perform what would otherwise be hegemonic duties mm -hmm. the more robust those tools are the larger the self-sustaining commons is going to be able to be so it's more like we need to design uh, the immune system our commons rather than its metabolism that's that's very well put and uh, you know this has been I want you to know this has been very useful and educational for me to get this kind of soundings because I grapple with these questions a lot and that was well put about uh, I mean the scale issue is something I've not really thought that much about but I think there's a lot of important things on that issue well, thank you so thank you